In this video, we're going to be continuing this topic of judgment because that is what God's putting on my heart. So um, the word for judgment that is used in the Bible in Greek is krima. I'm going to kind of skip through um, Strong's definitions because I just honestly, I don't always find them to be um, all that helpful. I think it's most helpful to look at how God uses uh, the word in a sentence, but you can feel free to look it up. So what we're going to do, um, and often what we do in these videos when we're doing a study together, is we just kind of look at how God used that in a sentence, and we just read through the different passages so that we can get a sense and a feel for what God was saying and the different contexts with which he's used this, because it helps us to understand how has he established this concept in the word. And why is that important? I'll tell you why. Because God established certain things, as we saw when we were going through kind of a series on slavery, God established certain things, and then the devil does his little spin on it in the world. And so us having been born into that and then counterfeit Christianity, you know, teaching that, we have developed very skewed perspectives of what God is actually saying. And so that when we hear certain things about slavery, it's like we can't even wrap our heads around it because it's been such a disgusting thing in the world. Or we hear judgment and it totally freaks us out, like we shy away from it. Well, judgment was established as a communication tool to help us to understand when I start sending these things, you better return to me. In order to help us to understand, we'd gotten too far. When you have that feeling of fear, you're feeling a version of judgment. Hello, get back, get back in step with me. Return to me because you're getting too far. Is God doing that in love? Because I don't see that a parent whose child is running away from them, you know, in a public place, that by them trying to protect their child and give them consequences and, ha and, and cause them to stay close to them, do you see that as a bad thing with a parent? Well, why do we see that as a bad thing when God starts sending consequences for our behavior? We see that as a mean God. Well, what if he sends significant consequences because he knows that there's a significant lesson that needs to be learned. Um, a lot of people had difficulty understanding, like being able to wrap their own hearts around what God did with me with this contractor situation where a blade on a motor was being pointed at me after I had made the decision to separate from God and disobey not only the covenant for salvation that I have with him, but also a written covenant that I made with him a few years ago regarding making certain decisions and how I would make those decisions with him. And I made a conscious decision to step away from him and he gave me consequences. And yes, by my own standards, by my own understanding, I think that those consequences are really severe because I thought I was going to die for a minute. I was really terrified and yet God knows what he's doing. He knows how serious it is for me to step away from him. Who am I to say, my sin's not compensatory to this? Who am I to say, you're wrong in what you sent? You're wrong in what you allowed? Actually, I see that he's right. He's very right because I know how serious it is. I know that my stepping away from him and being willing to break a covenant knowingly and to say, you know what, I'm, you're taking too long. What is that going to lead to eventually? It's going to lead to me forsaking my covenant and losing my eternal life. It's serious. And he wants me to know that it's serious. And he wants me to know that it's not okay for me to mess around. And he wants me to know that as I'm sitting here talking with you every day and teaching what he's built in me and teaching a particular message, that he holds me to greater accountability to live that in my own life. And I know that to be true and I take it seriously. And so I take seriously his rebuke of me. I should not be messing around. And just as Paul said that he takes it seriously, that he disciplines his body, that he disciplines himself and he has to live the things that he's teaching or he would disqualify himself. That is the message that I'm sharing with you, that I know that to be true. It's not okay for me to make my own rules and it's not okay for me to make a promise to him and then decide what parts of that promise I'm going to pick and choose to keep. How does that work in a marriage? So he does judge, he does punish, he ju does discipline, and he does it all in love. And so if we're not understanding how that has anything to do with love, 
then we need to move our hearts to him and stop expecting him to move his heart to us. So let's take a look at these different contexts of how he used the word judgment. And as you're listening to this, I want you to listen to who does he expect us to be? How does he expect us to become according to his heart? Matthew 7, 2, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Oh, you mean I'm supposed to love others as I love myself? I'm supposed to want for them as I want for myself? I'm not supposed to set myself apart as being higher, as more exalted than others? You mean you don't give favoritism, Lord? You mean I'm not more special than other people? Sorry to break it to you, but we'll be held to the same standard. And so we need to develop that standard in our hearts of mercy and love and understanding and compassion, just as he has done that with us, right? Just as we, when we're experiencing certain consequences, we start pleading for mercy. We hopefully start examining ourselves, learning from what he has sent and repenting. And in the same way, if someone comes back and they have done likewise, they have truly repented meaning truly examined themselves, acknowledged and changed, not just come back and said, I'm sorry. When they have repented, we forgive them. And he does the same with us. That's how his judgment works. He may still give us certain consequences, but he will not give us grief unnecessarily. He will not give us grief willingly. He will give us grief as he knows it is good. Mark 12, 40, they devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. So we have a God who is just. We have a God that if he sees that others who are in positions of power are using the authority that God has given them, the place that he has given them to use correctly, that they're using that to oppress and hurt his children, they will be punished most severely. They will experience the most severe judgment. Oh, but I don't like to think of God like that. I don't like thinking of a wrathful God. Well, do you want a God who's just or not? Luke 23, 40, but the other criminal rebuked him. Now, remember, this is the other criminal who's on the other side of Jesus on the cross. And he's just got done, gotten done telling Jesus, why don't you save yourself and save us? But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we're getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Okay, so the word sentence here, since you are under the same sentence, that is the same word that is being interchanged with judgment, that word krima. Well, what is a sentence? It is a determination of consequence. So that is the context with which Peter is talking when he says in 1 Peter 4, 17, that judgment begins, krima begins with God's household. The sentencing, the punishment, the judgment, the measurement. Just because we turn back and we say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I stepped away from you. Look how many days God was teaching me how important this covenant is. How many days have I been doing videos on this very thing, telling you now he's teaching me this, now he's teaching me that, now he's showing me this, now he's giving me a piece of his heart. Who am I to judge what he's doing? Who am I to turn back and say, my sin didn't necessitate this. Who am I to condemn him? All I am is one to receive from him. The only thing I should be doing in every single situation is saying, what's God doing here? All right, Lord, what are you doing? What are you doing here? I know you're sovereign. I believe in you. I trust you. I have faith in you. I'm living it out. Tell me what you're doing. What do you want me to receive? What do you want me to learn? You want to use me? All right, I'll expose myself. I will talk about it on the videos. I will share. You will be glorified. I belong to you. You redeemed me. You get to use me however you want. Is that the attitude that you have when you're doing this work? Is that the attitude that you're bringing as you have circumstances in your life, as you have symptoms in your body or in your mind or in your emotions? What is your attitude? What is your heart? What did Abraham do? Did he turn up to God and say, you murderer, I'm not going to do that. No, he leaned into what God wanted him to do. And his belief and his faith were attributed as righteousness. 
Again, same context, Luke 24, 20, the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. That was his sentence. We have a sentence. We have certain things that have to be done. And yet it's different from the way that the world does. The world does it without any real concern about whether we're even learning from that, right? And sometimes the sentence like doesn't even make sense, right? Is not even a logical consequence for behavior. But we have to know that our God knows what he's doing, that he surpasses the best human ability. He can teach us for days with one situation. As I demonstrated with you, and that's the reason I shared it, to be poured out as an offering so that you could see what this looks like in practice. John 9, 39, Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who, will, who see will become blind. What does he mean by that? For judgment, I have come into this world. And then he follows it up with an example to help us understand what he's talking about. So that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Why would that be judgment on, the, on those who see will become blind? When he restored the blind man's sight and um, the blind man caught up with him again a little later and he asked him, do you believe in the son of man? And he said, who is he? And he so that I you know, can see him. And he said, you see him right now. He's standing before you. And he says, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment, I've come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. And the Pharisees were standing nearby and they heard him say this and they said, what, are we blind too? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim to see, your guilt remains. You are judged. For judgment, he has come into the world so that the blind will see and those who see or claim to see, right? Those who see will become blind. And again, I want to remind you that for those who don't have a heart for God, what does he do? What did he do? He hardened them so that they wouldn't know who Jesus was when he was here. And again, what does he say? That his children perish for lack of knowledge because they rejected truth. He hands them over to deception. And for them, judgment will come later. But right now, judgment has come to his household. Acts 24, 25, as Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. <laughs> oh boy, does that sound familiar. Stop talking to us about these things. I don't want to hear this. Stop telling us the truth. Tell us only pleasant things. That sound familiar? Isaiah 39 through 11. These are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to obey the Lord's instruction. They say to the seers, stop seeing visions and the prophets. Do not prophesy to us the truth. Speak on to us pleasant words prophesy illusions, get out of the way, turn off the road, rid us of the Holy One of Israel. We don't want to hear the truth. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? That's Romans 2, 2 through 3. First thing, we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. Is his judgment against us not also based on truth? And do we think that we will escape God's judgment when we, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things. Again, that was like the first scripture that we read, that we are going to be measured with that same measurement, that God's judgment is based on truth. God's judgment is also based on what he knows is good and right and what he knows needs to be learned and worked out in order for us to be saved. Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. Don't go back to your thinking in counterfeit Christianity. You have to understand how you invoke that gift. How do you receive that gift? You receive it by faith. There absolutely is judgment. And so the entire word needs to be taken together so Peter says one thing. Peter says that judgment has already begun with God's household. And Paul is saying, nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. So you're judged for one sin, but the gift follows many sins and brings justification. Sure does. It's all true. What Peter says is true. What Paul says is true. And we have to find a way to reconcile that. 
Well, what is judgment? There's the judgment or the consequences that are being worked out right now. And then there's the judgment that's going to come on the wicked, which we often refer to that as being the judgment. Well, there's also this judgment that we're experiencing right now that we've been experiencing since Peter said that judgment has begun with his household. And what do we do when the judgment comes? Well, God told us in the Old Testament, he said, when I start sending these things, when you start seeing these things, when you start seeing plagues, illness, famine, pestilence, when you start seeing these things, you return to me and I'll heal you. And Jesus came and he taught us how to do this, this job in our heart, this work in our heart. Who is he preaching all the time? Blessed are those who are merciful. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed are, the, blessed are those who are pure of heart. All of this is an inside job. All of this is a heart job. You can't just say, okay, let me be pure of heart. All right, let me be merciful. How are you going to be merciful when someone's pointing a blade at your face, turning on a motor and defiling your property and walking off with a demonic, maniacal laugh? You tell me, you're going to be able to do that without working on your heart? You're going to be able to receive that on your own without sorting it through with God? This is a heart job. There is no way to do this in your flesh. And there's no way to do it apart from him because frankly, I can tell you right now, I'm not good of myself. I don't want to be merciful to someone like that. When I'm the one who now gets to foot the bill, when I'm the one who's feeling afraid, when I'm the one who's experiencing these consequences, I don't want to be merciful. I don't want to pray for someone like that. And so there's some work that has to happen in my heart in order to be able to do it. And to be able to do it truly, not just with the words in a prayer, to truly see that this man is in bondage and that... I need to pray for him and that I need to trust God rather than the work of my own hands for justice. This is work that's done in the heart. There's no way to receive that gift if we're not going to be willing to do this work in our hearts. But here's the thing is that those who are standing there on the day of judgment, they are going to be so bogged down in sin with so much judgment that's going to come on them. And there is no way that by the work of their hands that they're going to be able to do that. They're, they're not going to be able to be justified. And yet we, through faith, through obedience and working out this judgment and receiving what God is building on, in us through faith, through faith and understanding and that work in our hearts, we're going to be justified. But had we not, had we not worked this out with him, had we not had faith, if we were not doing this work, we will not be justified. And again, what does he say in Daniel? He says, many are going to fall in order to be purified, made spotless and refined. That is not being said as something that he's going to do. It's something that he's going to do with us that we have to receive from him. That's how we become purified, spotless, and refined. We're going to be put through the furnace. We're going to be here, or some of us are going to be here, for the hour of trial and testing that he's going to bring on the entire earth. And it is through that judgment that we're going to be proving our faith. Justified by what? Justified by our hearts. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. We don't. And if he's doing something, then we can't pray it away. We have to receive what he's doing. We've got to use the information that we have been taught in his word by his shepherds, the ways, the many ways in which he is speaking to us in order to understand what he's calling us into address. And if it takes several weeks, then so be it. If it takes a while, so be it. But I see people in the habit of giving up. And because they're giving up, what do they expect him to do for them? If you're going to give up on him, what do you expect from him? I'll tell you what you can expect from him. He's going to bring you lower. If you are actually in him, he's going to bring you lower. And that's the best that could happen to you. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Ah, that's very interesting. All right. That's first Colossians 6, 7. The interesting thing about this is that this is, God has taught me this multiple times. He doesn't want me using the world's legal system. And this is absolutely right. I don't think I've ever read it in this way. Nine, why not rather be wronged and why not rather be cheated? And I know that many people are not going to understand this because we have all, way, all kinds of ways of justifying the things that we do in the world and the things that we do by the work of our hands. And many people are not going to understand that I decided not to press charges on this person. And they're going to say things like, well, what if he goes and does it to someone else? 
I didn't have control over whether he was going to do it to me. Who says that I can have control over whether he's going to do it to someone else? That God has control over that. And so this scripture here confirms what God has told me repeatedly. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Do you think that I'm concerned about that people are going to come after me now because I'm putting that out there because I'm saying, oh, this is my attitude and this is what I do? God knows how to deal with them too. We either believe in his sovereignty or we believe in the work of our hands. That never got me anywhere. I'd rather be wronged. I'd rather be cheated because I know who vindicates me in the end and I know who provides for me. Would I rather disobey God? Because he's the one that I'm supposed to fear. So Paul is telling the Colossians that they... The very fact that they have lawsuits among them means that they have been completely defeated already. This is the context of that word, krima. If you've ever been through a court battle, you know that there are so many things that have to happen inside of you in order to endure that and in order to justify yourself. I mean, like who who really can go to court and say, yeah, I'm fully justified. I am 100% in the right. I mean, even before God, you know what I mean? I don't think that there was anything that I did to, you know, call this guy on to point a blade in my face, but there's stuff that I did that was wrong with God. And in order to navigate this kind of a legal system that is just corrupt and unjust and it's of the world, you got to act certain ways. You got to exaggerate and embellish certain things or hide certain things because that might implicate you. I don't want to live like that. More importantly, God doesn't want me to live like that. He wants me to wait for justice with him. He wants me to trust that he knows how to protect me. He wants me to trust that he's sovereign over my life. And so that's where I place my my trust and my faith and my hope and my protection, my confidence. I know better than to return to the work of my hands. First Colossians eleven twenty nine. Oh my goodness, I've been saying Colossians and I meant Corinthians. I'm sorry. First Corinthians eleven twenty nine. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. And then there's other places in scripture where um, where Paul talks about like you engage in sexual immorality, how you're doing this against your own body, like you're sinning against your whole body. Your own body is the way that he says it. So you're bringing a sentence on yourself. You're bringing a penalty on yourself. Elsewhere in scripture, in Matthew 5, 26, Christ says, truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. And here he's talking about settling matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. And I believe that this is naturally talking about, you know, them taking things up with God, things that you've done to them, that you need to turn from your ways and you need to turn to them and repent and do things right. Otherwise, you'll be thrown into prison and you will not get out until you've paid the last penny. So he gives us an opportunity, doesn't he? Just like a parent with with a couple of siblings who are fighting and one of the siblings is doing wrong to the other sibling, they're given an opportunity. Settle this on your own or I'm going to get involved. And if I have to get involved because you're not doing the right thing, it's not going to be pretty. So are you getting a feel for the heart of God? Are you getting a feel for how he established this concept of krima? There are consequences for our behavior. And it's kind of a shame or kind of sad that I've got to do a video on this that we don't understand. And, and I mean, I'm, I, I'm not blaming anyone but the devil and counterfeit Christianity because, you know, I hear stories about, about people who are going to a university and their professors are telling them, teaching at a Christian university that God does not punish, that that is false doctrine. Have they ever read Leviticus 26? God doesn't punish, really? And that's craziness. And then everybody in the class is writing, uh, you know, a paper on it. And he's reinforcing everybody who's standing by that narrative, by that false doctrine. And anyone who's speaking against it and saying, hey, the word of God says this, he won't acknowledge their comment because we don't acknowledge a narrative that's opposite from our own. Why are we not having a conversation if it's being based on the word of God? That's insanity. And so even if we hear that and we hear that, you know what, that doesn't sound right. Some of us are not bringing that into practice. Some of us are not bringing that into our actual life when we're experiencing certain circumstances and we're realizing that God is dealing with us on our sin and that we need to be learning. And then whatever's going on is going to remit, not because it's just simply going to disappear because God is going to remit because God is going to relent when we have returned to him. And Joel tells us sometimes he even sends a blessing I woke up this morning after days of really of returning to him, of 
seeking and pursuing him and receiving from him. What do you want me to learn? What do you want me to understand about the way that I turned away from you about this circumstance? What are you showing me? And I didn't just sit there and wait for him to dole out the answers to me. I listened to what was going on in my body, my feelings, my dreams, my memories. What is this connected to? I listened to him in all the ways that he speaks. I used myself as an offering to share with you. I did all of the things that I was supposed to be doing on a daily basis until this morning I woke up and he blessed me so much today. I mean, honestly, one after another, there were some things that I needed to get done today that I really was not looking forward to getting done. And he handed them to me on a, on a platter. Literally, I received a phone call about that very thing that I had to go searching for, you know, to go uh, sort through, which wasn't a really a pleasant thing. And it was done two seconds. The next thing that I had to do that I really didn't want to do, I ended up getting money back on that particular thing. A friend of mine contacted me and brought me lunch and I got to spend time with him today, blessed all day long. And I woke up with that feeling, just knowing that I had been restored, knowing that we were good, that he's pleased. And then he began teaching me about this topic of judgment and he used this other situation that came up that I started to think, ah, oh, this could really go this way or that. And based on, you know, things that I've done in the past, and I really don't want to deal with those consequences. And so I had to work my heart into, well, what if those things happen? What if it's God's will that I have to deal with those consequences? I'm not entitled from being spared from consequences. There are so many consequences that God has spared me from, but I'm not entitled to it whatsoever. And so what I'm brought into position to understand right now with regard to this topic of judgment is that I deserve judgment. I deserve to experience the full breadth of what I've done. And yet he has mercy on me. He wants me to learn the lessons and to work towards my salvation, to understand what I need to understand within my heart, to have wisdom according to his wisdom. He's not just sending consequences willy-nilly. He's sending them for a purpose so that we learn and so that we understand and so that we're being built and so that we have a heart after him because we have to become holy and sanctified as he is holy. So again, what do I do? I have no ability to control what judgment I'm going to experience. What I do have the ability to do is continue to rend my heart to him, to continue to say, you know what? You know what's good. Let the Lord know, do what he knows is good. That's what Eli said when he was told by Samuel that his sons were going to be destroyed. He said, let the Lord do what he knows is good. Because Eli knew that his sons were not doing good. He knew that they were sleeping with the women at the, at the temple and that they were doing bad things. They were threatening people. They were taking the sacrifices for themselves and he had rebuked them and they would not change. And so he knew when the Lord said he was going to destroy them, he knew that God was doing what he was going to do in his righteousness. And he said, let the Lord do what he knows is good. That needs to be our attitude. Let him do what he knows is good. My job is to learn this and then he will relent. His judgment is not merely a sentence by a judge who doesn't care about you. He is a judge who cares about us. He is a judge who has a purpose and a long-term goal. And so we have to understand what our conduct deserves and understand the mercy that's been given to us. And when we understand that, when I understand that there are so many situations where God has relented and he has not given me what I deserved, what is what did um, you know Eli tell Job in... Job 33, that a person who is wasting away, their bones once hidden now stick out, right? They loathe the choicest meal. The person who is dying, and if there's an angel at their side, one out of, what does he say, a thousand or a million, <laughs> sent to tell them how to be upright, sent to teach them and minister to them, to teach them how to be upright. And they say to God, spare, spare this person. I've found a ransom for them. And they can pray to God and they can find favor with him and they'll be restored so that they can go to others and they can say, I've sinned and I, and I didn't do what was right and I was spared. I did not get what I deserved. Listen, the whole word has to be taken together. Just because you don't get what you deserve doesn't mean you're not going to get some of it. The fact that we're not getting all of it should be a testament to the mercy and great love of God, the compassion of God. 
Because I truly believe that if I was getting all that I deserve, I would simply be destroyed. And then yet again, what does Jesus say? The one who has the greater debt is the one who is going to love the king more. I hope this helps you to understand the posture that we need to get in, in order to receive God's ministry and in order to heal. It's just so important as we're entering into this work. So if you're doing that work in Heart Known Series, I really want to encourage you to take some time to meditate and pray about this topic so that you can understand what's been given to you and you can understand the correct posture that you need to get in as you're doing that work. Thank you for listening. God bless you and I'll see you in the next video.